Christianity is a long walk in one direction. How do we not grow weary? That's our topic for today. G'day, I'm Paul Clark, Senior Minister of Redcliffe Uniting, and thanks for the feedback from the online congregation. It's always great to hear how God speaks to you through these services. As always, drop us an email if you want to connect deeper. We're up to our second last week in the book of Galatians, a book that continues to change lives. After I preached last week on carrying one another's burdens and carrying our own burdens, someone came to me and said, how do we keep going? I want to help others, but sometimes it seems the same people need carrying over and over and over again. How do we stop becoming cynical in doing good? I wasn't sure what to say, but then I read this week's reading and I realised That's exactly where St. Paul goes next. He must have had the same thoughts. Sometimes it feels like there's two types of people in the world, those who need to be carried and those who do all the carrying. It's enough to make one want to give up. But how do we stay strong? What did St. Paul write? First, if you only look at these four verses, you might think Paul is going back to law, be good and you will be saved. But you have to remember that he just spent five chapters reminding us we are saved by our faith, our trust in Jesus. We're saved by grace, a free gift. These words are then to people who are saved, who are free. You are free. Don't use your freedom to feed the flesh. They are rules for freedom. Remember I said the law is now not about your salvation, but about who you become and who the world becomes. This stuff is still important because do you want to live the good life? Do you want to minimise evil and suffering? Do you want to make a better world? Are you bringing hell to earth and your own life or heaven to earth? So Paul begins, don't fool yourselves. God's laws can't be ignored. If you sow to bring the flesh, you will bring hell into your world. If you sow to please the spirit, you will reap eternal life. Sometimes it's like we go out into the paddock. We swear at the top of our lungs. We blaspheme. We curse God. And since lightning doesn't come down and smite us, we think God's not there. We can do whatever we like. Or we might go to church. We might follow the rules. We might restrain ourselves. It looks like everyone else is having more fun. Indeed, bad things happen to us. And we say, what's the point? The truth is we probably live a normal life, but we drink a little too much or look at some images on the internet we shouldn't or we gossip and tell a few few white lies, get lazy. Nothing bad happens, so we think it doesn't matter. This passage tells us God plays the long game. God plays the long game. Why? Because he's gracious. If every time we did something wrong, clear and brutal punishment came from above, who would get past their seventh birthday? God is gracious, giving us time to become something, to become someone, to work ourselves out. And while it seems those little things don't matter. This passage says they do. They add up. Little things we put into our lives now catch up to us when we're 40, 50, 60. I've seen it. 40, 50 year old men who come into my office, their relationship has broken down. They have lost their job. They've lost a number of jobs. They're almost unemployable. They have few friends. And who do they blame? 
their wife, their, their boss, the world. You don't have to spend too long with them to hear that they have sown some bad attitudes into their life that have become so second nature they can't see them. An expectation that their wife will do all the housework, obey all their commands, be as hot and as willing as the girls on the internet. There's no mutual respect, love, compassion, intimacy or responsibility. They want to be the boss and have an inability to take correction or direction. They think of themselves more highly than they ought. They have long stopped learning and being teachable. They've lost the ability to wonder, to be curious. And it happens to women too. If you so stupid, if you so cynical, shortcuts, selfishness and sin in your life, you'll reap stupid. Now you might be thinking, uh, Paul, there are a few world leaders out there who would challenge that assertion. Some of them have no shame sowing stupid. I would say, and the Bible would say it with me, of course, why would you steal, lie and cheat? Because they are a shortcut to glory. But God is in the long game. Stolen apples are sweet, but leave a bitter taste. Many of the Psalms cry out the same thing. Lord, why are the wicked winning and the, and the good dying young? God's answer? Wait. 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 Glory gained by shortcut is cut short. The reason some people get away with it is because they haven't been held accountable yet. Most of us get our just desserts early or along the way. Be grateful for that. You don't want to get your just desserts at the end when there's no time left to repent. There will always be the wicked who get to the top and the good who get trampled along their way. But God says, in the long run, you get what's coming, or rather, you become what you're getting. Because this is so much more about who you are becoming than what you get. Not only does the Bible say this, but research too. While there are always outliers, people who live solid, truthful, faithful, biblical lives do better than people who sow destruction in general. People of faith live seven years longer than people with no faith on average. They tend to be wealthier, happier, have longer marriages. But again, it's not about the stuff. So if we know it's about the long game, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we keep going. Keep going. Keep going. I hope the drama made that real for you. Because I want to say it again. It's not so much about the other, but about you. Now that sounds selfish, but what I'm saying is, if you keep looking for your motivation to do good, coming from the other person changing, being grateful and being transformed, you're going to become cynical and disillusioned. People do change, but fewer than we hope. I know talking to the Department of Community staff, they have wins, parents who get their lives together and get their kids back, but far too few. So many parents keep sewing stupid. Three steps forward, four steps back, over and over and over again. It's why they have such a high staff turnover. They want to make a difference and they just keep seeing stupid. And of course, when stupid is hurting kids, it's hard to keep doing that. We have to understand it's not what our decisions to sow good does to others. It's what our decisions to sow good does for us that matters. Each decision to sow good 
transforms us. It changes us. God is making a new creation. People ready for the new creation, heaven. It's called sanctification in the church. We're saved, members of heaven. Now we have to take off our old, smelly, fleshly clothes and put on the spirit. Well, we simply won't fit into heaven. This verse sums it up well. If you are kind, people may accuse you of ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are honest, people may cheat you. Be honest anyway. People are often unreasonable and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you find happiness, people may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have and it may never be enough. Give your best anyway. For you see, in the end, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. That poem was seen on the wall of Mother Teresa, but it was written by Kent Keith back in 1968. Jesus didn't go to the cross for the joy of our transformation. He went to the cross because of who he was. If he had gone to the cross to see us change, at the Last Supper, he would have given up when he saw the dumb looks on the disciples' faces. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he would have given up when we all fell asleep, when Judas betrayed him with a kiss, when Peter pulled a sword. If, if Jesus had done it for the feeling of our gratefulness, he would have given up during the trial when he was falsely accused, when Peter denied him, when the high priest slapped him across the face. If Jesus was doing it for the kudos, he would have given up before Pilate when Pilate questioned him, when the soldiers whipped him, when the crowd yelled, crucify him. If Jesus was doing it for the glory, he would have given up when the nails went in, when the crowd mocked him, and when the sky turned black and he was abandoned by his father. Jesus went to the cross because of who he was, not because of who we might become, but who might we become because of who he was. Missionaries in North America came across an Indian chief who claimed that he already knew the God of the white man. He already had faith. The missionaries asked the chief, what is it like this faith you have? There are two dogs inside me. One is a mangy stray, wild, evil and hungry with desire. The other is pure and good, noble and obedient. These two dogs fight within me to see who will get the upper hand. The missionaries on the edge of their seats ask the chief, which dog wins? Whichever dog I feed. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. We reap what we sow. Sow to please the Spirit, and from the Spirit you will reap eternal life. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, what a powerful message you've given us in Galatians. Are we like that 40, 50, 60 year old man or woman who has sown things in our life and now we've come to a point where it feels like there's no return, our relationships are breaking down, our, our job career is in, in the dust, our, our social life is, is gone. If we feel like there's nowhere to go, Lord, that's good news because we've got no excuse, no more reason to, to put it off. We can come to you. We can actually say, Lord, I'm sorry. I've stuffed this life you've given me. I've been living all these little things 
and they've added up and they've added up and they've just smashed me. Lord, I've got nowhere else to go but to fall in your loving arms. Lord, take me. Fill me with your spirit. Lord, help me to toss all that old stuff away. Help me to, to be born again, born anew, that I might have the innocence of a child, the curiosity, the wonder to start my life over again, to be willing to learn, to be mentored, to, to be discipled in your name, to live a new life. Oh, Lord, if we need to cry that prayer today, may we cry it. Lord, perhaps we're, we're doing okay. We're living our life, but we're feeling like, how come I'm doing all the carrying? Why don't other people help? Lord, help us to take our eyes off the other and put our eyes on you. That in going to the cross, if you'd watched us, you would have given up. But you didn't. You, you were just love eternal, perfect love. That's your motivation. It's who you are. Lord, may we put our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. May we be good, do good, because it's who we are, because it's who you are. Not to earn, not to transform, but to be ready, to be that new creation for the new creation that you're bringing. Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you that you give us new birth, second chances, new life, over and over and over again. In Jesus' name, amen.